No Man Has A Right To Own Mountains, Chapter 4 Now that's what I call a meal. It's filled the gap in my stomach up nicely. How's your ankle, Mr. O'Donnell? I'm not going to be able to get my boot back on. It's swollen up like a balloon. Anyhow, lad, I'll survive. But let's have a bit less of the mister. My name's Jack to me friends. But how are you going to get back home? Is there a taxi service? Aye, old Alice Broadbottom. Shall I ring him for you? It would be helpful. He glanced at the clock. It was coming up to three. Ask him if he can pick us up about 6.30. I'm comfortable here, and maybe Rosie would like to have a look round the village. Rosie looked up, still fondling Titch's ears. I'm fine, Grandad. I need to keep you out of trouble. Anyway, you haven't finished telling me about the trespass. Who's Benny Rothman, and how does the Duke of Thingy-me-bob come into it? Devonshire, Rosie, the Duke of Devonshire. He owns most of the land hereabouts, and the way he got it is an interesting tale in itself. Well, go on, Grandad. We've only got three and a half hours. Patience is a virtue, Rosie, my love. Now, to cut a long story short, we have to go back to 1066. 1066? What's that got to do with anything? The old man chuckled. That was the year England began to really become a nation. William of Normandy, the descendant of Norsemen who'd settled in part of what is now France, invaded our island and defeated Harold Godwin, who claimed to be the lawful king. William changed the pattern of land ownership forever. He took all the land into his own hands and then parceled bits of it out to all the barons who'd helped him defeat Harold and to the Saxon earls who collaborated with him. He introduced the feudal system, and that's how England's system of private land ownership began. William was the land thief in chief. He took a lot and gave it out to his favourite lackeys and Saxon traitors. Oh, so that's how the Duke of Thingamibob ended up owning Kinder. No, at least not directly. Rosie frowned. William kept a lot of the land out of private ownership. It was known as King's Land, or Waste, or Forest, or Common Land, depending on the part of the country it was in, or the use it was to be put to. Some of it was reserved for hunting and the keeping of game. On some of it, people had the right to graze cattle, horses, or sheep. In other parts, people had the right to dig turf for their fires, to collect firewood, or to allow their pigs to forage for acorns. Most upland country, like Kinder, was Kingsland, and so it remained for 700 years, until the 18th century. What happened then? The Enclosure Acts, Rosie. Kinder were one of the prime examples, although it was rather late being enclosed. Why was it a prime example? It was enclosed after 1830. Up to that point, no individual owned it. It's wild land up there, Rosie. Over 2,000 acres of it, mainly blanket bog. Fit for nothing agricultural, but sheep grazing. Before it were enclosed, people had the right to traverse it at will. There were innumerable tracks and old drove roads, some of them going back to Roman times. Over 40 acres in two areas, one known as Poor Man's Peace, and the other as poor man's wood, were reserved for the use of the poor of Hayfield. Other hamlets and settlements dotted around Kinder had similar allotments, but from 1830 on all that changed. The land was surveyed and portions of it parcelled out to landowners in the surrounding area, and what they did was to allot the biggest portions to the largest landowners. In other words... To the rich, according to their riches, 2,000 acres were parcelled out, and to the poor, according to their poverty, no land was given, and the 40 acres they already had allocated for their use was taken away. You will find no mention of poor man's peace or poor man's wood on any modern map. That's not fair. 
There's nothing fair in a country like ours, run by rogues and villains, Rosie, except the weather, and that's only fair sometimes. Anyhow, I'm sure if you spoke to the local vicar, he'd tell you it were all in line with the Bible's teachings. How can it be? The old man chuckled, picked up a paper napkin, folded it, and tucked it under his shirt collar, like a clerical dog collar. Then, in a deep voice, he stated gravely, For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Matthew, chapter 13, verse 12, the King James Version of the Bible, approved by both church and state. He looked across the table at his granddaughter once more. So, you see, young Rosie, because the Duke of Devonshire were the biggest landowner in the area, he got most a kinder scout. Mind you, there were another Christian cleric way back in the 14th century, John Balby name, a follower of St. Francis, a friar, who was one of the leaders of the landless English peasants in what was known as the Peasants' Revolt. He challenged the established church and the landed gentry, using the teachings of the Bible as his weapon. He asked the question, When Adam delved and Eve span, who then was the gentleman? He argued that God had given the land to Adam and Eve and all their successors, not to a few noblemen. Ralph laughed. You and my old man have something in common at least. The two of yous would get on like house on fire, Mr. O'Donnell. He's not so fond of Devonshire's. Why not, lad? He's a tenant farmer and there is landlord. No wonder he's such a bad-tempered old so-and-so. Ralph laughed again. He's not that bad. His bark's worse than his bite. Like most old farmers, he's going through a bad time. New Zealand lamb's dirt cheap, and there's no call for wool. My mother's wanting to start doing bed and breakfast, but the old man's dead against it. He says she'll be demeaning herself. He shook his head. He's a proud old so-and-so, but me and my brothers are working on him. Mum's quite right. We have to live, and the farm doesn't provide enough income. But what's so important about the land if it's not fit for anything but sheep? Rosie intervened. Why did the Duke of Thingy-me-bob stop people walking over it? Grouse, Ralph responded. Grouse? Yes, they're a grain bird, Rosie, and every year on the glorious twelfth the Duke and his cronies go up onto the moors to shoot them. You mean that's why my grandma was... Rosie got no further. She was interrupted in full flow by the sudden appearance of Ralph's father, accompanied by two younger men. Are you all right, Tower Ralph? Aye, of course I am. What's the... Come on, feyther, one of the others interjected. The older man shuffled his feet. I think. Well, I reckon I owe thy friends an apology, he finally said, looking very uncomfortable. Especially you, young miss. I'm sorry for me bad behaviour earlier. Rosie smiled her sweetest smile. Grandad laughed. No offence were taken, Mr. Gartside. Would you like a drink? That's very handsome of thee, had Feyther, we've cows to milk. Young Ralph put in his two penneth. Sit down, Feyther, I'll do your chores. This is Mr. O'Donnell and his granddaughter, Rosie. This is me Feyther, Jed, Mr. O'Donnell. Grandad leant across the table, holding his hand out. My name's Jack. I'm sorry I can't stand to shake your hand. I'm non-walking wounded. Here are, Rosie. Take this step bar. I'll have bitter. You get yourself whatever you want. What about you, Jed? I'll have same. It's very good of you. Your son tells me you're not a fan at Devonshire's. How else good at understatement? I'll leave you to it, Father. Will you and Rosie be coming up again, Mr. O'Donnell? Not if you don't start calling me Jack. He paused for a moment. I promised to take Rosie up to Edale Cross next weekend, but I don't know if I can manage it with this uncle, and I hate the idea of disappointing her. 
She could stay with us, couldn't she, Feather? She can have Sissy's room. I can show her round and she'd be company for our Connie. 